for those of you who are software engineers and programmers, you already know how Kent has changed your life in a positive way. For all the rest of you, he has. You probably just don't know it. Uh, so uh, without further ado, this is Kent Beck, the creator of Extreme Programming, uh, test-driven development, and boy, more other accomplishments than I can name. Thank you, Kent. I'm really glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming uh, early in the morning. And uh, for those of you for whom it's not early in the morning, uh, it's not such an accomplishment for you to be here. But uh, I'm glad you're here, too. Um, so I, am, I have the, uh, the privilege and honor of being the worst entrepreneur on the, uh, on the schedule today. Uh, at last count, I've been involved in 11 startups. Uh, none of which have made uh, significant money. Uh, only one of which has been uh, uh, successful on a large scale. That's, uh, that's JUnit. Um, I wasn't quite sure about opening my speech by disclaiming any, uh, any ability in the, uh, in the area that we're talking about. But I figured you'd figure it out soon enough anyway. So I should just uh, open up. But the thing is, I haven't given up because I can see, especially the lean startup stuff, has brought me new energy for continuing to try and build businesses around the technical capabilities that I spent most of my life uh, uh, trying to, to refine. Um, uh, I live in uh, southern Oregon, uh, way out in the boonies, and we have goats. No, no, really, goats. We just had two babies. They are so cute. It's like a little furry AT-AT. <laughs> they are, oh, they're wonderful. But uh, the other day I was out with the goats, and I, I was starting to scratch the goats because they bug you otherwise. And, uh, and the goat was, okay, whatever, whatever. And I went down the back and a little further down the back. And then right near their hip, this goat's hip, all of a sudden the goat just went, ooh, that feels great. And I thought, oh, it's interesting. So I can scratch all over this goat and nothing. And I hit this one spot, and all of us, the itchy spot. You know, you hit the itchy spot, and all of a sudden the same activity that I've been doing all along turns into something wonderful for this goat. I mean, I can't really imagine what it's like. I don't, don't want to really imagine what it's like. But, but <laughs> the thing, I could see that the same activity in lots of different places, small effect. And all of a sudden, that same little activity has a, a completely outsized effect on the, on the goat's experience of, the, uh, of, of scratching. And that's a little like startups for me. You keep doing stuff, no response, and you do stuff, no response, and you do stuff, no response, and then you do, the, the eighth idea you try out takes off. It's not like you're itching, you're, it's not like you're scratching any different. You just hit an itchy spot, and when you hit an itchy spot, all of a sudden the reaction tells you this is something special. And I've had the good fortune to have that happen several times in my career uh, where software patterns or test-driven development, uh, those, I mean, I, I've had a hundred ideas that scale, but those at that time really hit an itchy spot. And as, a, as an entrepreneur, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that itchy spot. Not, not how can I somehow sustain 100-hour weeks. I mean, that's like uh, getting the chainsaw out to scratch the goat. It doesn't work. Not, not twice. <laughs> but how can I take the things that I do and find the spot that, that really some, there's, it's a combination of factors, right? There's, uh, there's timing, there's luck, and there's scratching. If you're not scratching, you're not going to hit the itchy spot. I guarantee you that. And uh, Lean Startups is a great example of this for me, too. 
Because something about the timing, the message, the people, the market were all just right. So in the world, there are, there are probably thousands of people doing the same kinds of things that Eric was doing a year ago, and it just didn't hit the itchy spot. But something about lean startups and the combination of, hey, my, uh, my business model for the last 15 years stopped working. What am I going to do? So there's a bunch of motivation. The incredible capital efficiencies, not just in software. I mean, that's, I think most people here are probably in software, but, but hardware businesses too, their capital efficiency has gone up by a factor of 10. So you've got the need for a new business model. You have capital efficiency. You have uh, markets that are much more efficient. And uh, all of that came to... And then a community of practice. Right? There, are, uh, there are people... There were isolated people who were doing parts of lean startups. And the name, the message, the way it was delivered... The timing, all of it came together. So for me, lean startups and, and this response and the, the response around the globe is really, that's one of those itchy spots. And it's, and it's great that it's happening. So let me see. Here's the, uh, here's the basic loop. Build, measure, learn. I'm a build guy. That's, that's what I do. That's what I'm comfortable doing. If, uh, if I have a choice between doing something really valuable in measure or learn or doing something really trivial in build, I'll build every, every time because I'm a builder. It's what I'm comfortable doing. When I looked at this, from a, a lean thinking kind of perspective, one thing I realize is that this loop is actually backwards. It is the way that I've done it, and I told you I have a long record of, of failure doing it that direction. So if you don't want to, you don't need to try it. You, you can if you want, but this loop is backwards. I'll tell you two stories. Uh, I have two uh, startups going right now. Isn't that cool that we can multi-table now? You know, in, uh, in poker, when people play online poker, they started playing two games at once, and this was considered, ooh, you can play two games at Well, turns out poker is mostly boring. So you can actually play 20 games of poker at once, and that's called multi-tabling. Startups, as the, as the capital efficiency increases, right, you don't need 20 people to do a startup, then you don't need 10 people to do a startup, then you, then you can do a startup with five, and then with two, and then with one. It's not stopping there. You can do two startups. You can do five startups at once. I mean, at some point it's got to end, but <laughs> it's cool that that's, that, that kind of multi-tabling is possible. So, so I have two things going. One of them I'm doing completely wrong. And now I'm hoping to get some ideas here today. So I thought, well, I have this test-driven development idea, you know, which is this crazy idea that you write a test before you write the code, but the test always fails. So why do you write it then? Well, it turns out to be really cool and work really well. So I thought, well, I'll do some screencasts about TDD. You know, you can't make money selling books anymore. At least I can't, so i got to find some other media strategy. So maybe I'll do some screencasts. So I'll record myself doing test-driven development and then, you know, do a little narration and try and be both informative and entertaining, which is actually too much for me to do at once, but there you have it. So I'll record these and then I'll put them out there and see what people think. That's running the loop backwards. That starts with the build. So I recorded a couple episodes. I put them up on Vimeo, the first 10 minutes, unedited. 
And then uh, saw what, like, people, yeah, people viewed them a few hundred times. Okay, so there's some market out there. But then I'm kind of stuck on the learning phase. So I built, I measured, but what is it that I was trying to learn? Oh, I, I guess some people are interested. But where do I go from here? I ran the loop backwards on that project. I started with making something, because I just jumped to making things. And, and now I'm kind of stuck. I'll, I'll push it through to completion. I'll you know, get them out there and find a publisher and da, 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 all that stuff. But I get the feeling I lost a lot of value in that sequence. Let me contrast that with my, my uh, next project, which started with a need. I wanted to find out if I could tune up my 49-year-old brain. So I know my memory's not as good as it used to be. My cognitive skills aren't as good as they used to be. But can I slow that down? Can I recover some of what I lost? So I built a little game. Uh, and I'll be cagey about this, not because I'm trying to build some, you know, uh, uh, build up interest. I can see all of you are really excited about this idea. But, uh, but because I'm not ready for more feedback. So it, it, I'll announce it when the time comes to announce it. But I started with a question. Can I help myself think faster and more clearly? Oh, well, okay, so now what's the measurement of that? I take a task, I time it, and I measure the mistakes. Okay, so now what software would I need to write in order to measure that, in order to know whether or not I can improve my thinking. That one feels completely different. Because I ran the loop backwards, so the loop I think really should be called learn, measure, build. I don't, I don't say build, measure, learn. I say learn, measure, build because I want to start with a need. Now the next question is, can somebody else use the same tool to also help their thinking? Turns out the answer to that is yes. Then the next question is, can we get somebody to pay for this? And that's what I'm working on now. But it starts with a question. Learn, then what measurements are needed to support that, and then build. This uh, learn, measure, build is the principle of pull. In uh, lean manufacturing, you've got push, which is the way most people schedule work. You know, let me, how can I get my programmers working as good as possible, as most efficiently as possible? Then, then we'll see if anybody will buy it, right? That's the push model. We'll build this product and we'll see if anybody will buy it. The pull model says that gains micro efficiencies, like the programmers could work really fast in that environment but it sacrifices macro efficiencies by building things that people don't actually want. Now a number of those failed startups that I was talking about were building products, complicated, sophisticated, uh, carefully polished products that nobody ever actually bought. So in that environment, looking at it from a push perspective, Trying to do a better job of software engineering is not actually going to create any more value. So the first principle that I'll talk about today is, uh, is the principle of pull. And learn, measure, build is a way of making that concrete for, for startups. The second one is the principle of flow, and I'll get to that. After I've finished taking a shot at the... Uh, Agile Manifesto. Now, I was at the meeting where the Agile Manifesto was written. I was deathly ill and on some ungodly antibiotics, so I don't actually remember much of the meeting. Jim Highsmith and uh, Martin Fowler really deserve the credit for pulling all those pieces together. Ten years ago, the Agile Manifesto was a step forward. It was a least common denominator of the people in the room. 
That is, that, those were the things we all could agree on. Um, and we wanted to make it attractive to people. So we picked the word agile because everybody wants to be agile. Well, it turns out if you name your idea something that everybody wants, everybody will say they already are that. So, just a word of warning, Eric, wherever you are, that's going to happen. Oh, yeah, we're lean. Here's our 60-page here's our lean product spec. <laughs> here's our lean stealth, uh, stealth launch and stuff. Yeah, uh-huh. Lean private beta. Here's a good one. That'd make a great button. I mean, it's such an in-joke, though. But then you'd know you had somebody. Anyway, oh, and, and the, the reason it's uh, Beck et al. is because my parents had the good sense to have a name at the beginning of the alphabet, the Agile Manifesto, anyway. So, processes and tools. There was a day when, when people thought in the, now I'm focusing on, just on the build process, when people thought that what you needed to do to build software better was to have better processes and tools. If you had the right tools, and you had the right processes, it wouldn't matter who was executing. You could have any monkey write the software and it would come out exactly the same. Turns out that's true. <laughs> so processes and tools aren't enough. What you need at that point, it was a big step forward to say, hey, the people matter and how they interact with each other matters more than following some set process. So that was a step forward 10 years ago. If I look at software development as I practice it in startups, though, that's not enough. I need to go beyond that So that the, as an individual in a team building a startup, I need to think not about how good a job I can do, but how good a job we're doing. That means sometimes very, I mean, there's some practical and sometimes unattractive uh, implications of that. Sometimes if uh, I should do less than what I believe to be the very best, in order for the team to achieve more. So I might know about some really cool technique for solving a problem, but nobody else in the team has a PhD in that particular little area. So even though that might be the technically best way of solving a problem, I need to back away from that and say, hey, I'm on it, yes, but I'm on a team. If I'm the only person who understands this part of the system, then I need to back away from everything I know so that the team can achieve more. I might be in a situation where uh, I can check this in and I don't have to run the tests. And I need to say, no, the way we do things here is and have the discipline to fit in to uh, what the whole team is doing. The individuals interacting have a tendency to optimize their own performance. But team vision and discipline goes beyond that to talk about how are we going to make the most progress we can together. So, there's four bullets in the manifesto, and I'll go through each of them. So the second one is about comprehensive documentation. There was a day when the story was, if you had everything documented, if you had everything written down, then you'd be just fine, right? You, didn't, you wouldn't have to go, like, talk to people. You could just open up the book and read what the software did, except always the documentation was out of date, you, it was at, at best misleading, and, uh, and that was about it. So 10 years ago, we looked at that and said, 
you know, documentation is not the point. Working software is a big step forward. So if you have a perfect documentation for a frozen system that solves a problem nobody has anymore, that's just not as good as having some software that solves today's problems. And that was a big step forward. But the problem is that only goes so far. In a startup environment, it's not that you don't know how to write the software, nine times out of ten. I mean, my hats are off to somebody like a Flightcaster who clearly has some heavy-duty technology behind what they do. And I would, frankly, love to work in that environment because then I could pretend like I could ignore the other two parts of the cycle. Wouldn't that be cool? But you can't measure progress by working software in a startup. You, you start out a startup with a list of almost impossibles. I used to call them the potentially fatal assumptions, but that's too negative. You know, you, the potentially fatal assumption, somebody will pay money for this. Uh, you know, that we can acquire customers, uh, that this will be an engaging game, whatever. Those are all potential, uh, almost, it's almost impossible that somebody will pay money for a game on the web. Right? Really? Well, if it's only almost impossible, then you have something. If it's clearly true, then you don't have anything. Right? It's always the, it's always the crazy ideas that work out that are the most valuable. So you start out every startup with this list of almost impossibles. And to succeed, you need to find out which of those really is impossible and which of them turns out with some work to be possible. Working software can be part of answering those questions, but it isn't necessarily the best way to answer those questions. So uh, uh, beyond agile, software development is about creating the opportunity for learning as an organization, not just about writing code. Another myth from uh, 10 years ago that if you just had the right contract, everything would be clear and go smoothly. And the counterfactual is true. You could go visit a team you look at their soft, the, the, the contract the, between the supplier and the customer, and you say, uh, game over. You're finished. There's no way that you're going to be successful with this, just because the contract was wrong. So at that point, it's a, it's a big step forward to say collaborating with customers is much better than trying to nail down all the details right at the beginning. Yes, yes, that is definitely much better. So, now you're in a startup. You don't have a customer. Uh, I'd like to collaborate. <laughs> I'd like to collaborate. You can hear an echo, but that's it. So what do you do if you don't have a customer with whom to collaborate? Well, and Steve Blank will give you chapter and verse of this, and I hope I can pick up some pointers on that. You have to go find out who your customer is. Customer collaboration is great if you got a customer, and if you don't, you got to go find them. So agile development in a startup, or development in a startup, needs to go beyond just what it says in the, in the Agile Manifesto. I think I'm giving the video guy fits switching between my slides and my uh, face. Sorry about that. So uh, uh, there was a day 10, 15 years ago when the myth was the way you did a software project is you made a plan, plan the work, work the plan. Right? If I heard that one more time from a project manager, I was going to do something that was a class two or three felony, <laughs> depending on how annoying it got. So if, if you're planning to work, work the plan, and you realize, no, nah, this just, things change too much, then responding to change is a big step forward. 
to say, no, nah, it's, it's not enough to follow the plan because things just change too much. Reality diverges from the plan. Uh, reality is much less flexible than the plan. That, that, was the, that was the one fundamental point of that follow the plan thing, is that reality bends a lot less than the plan bends. But there you have it. So saying, let's respond to change. Our, our metaphor for executing a project is going to be responding to change. Well, cool. I mean, that's, that's a big step forward. Now you're in a startup. Nothing's changing yet because nothing's moving. You have to establish momentum first. Development in a startup requires initiating change, not just responding to it. Now, this is where my uh, anti-responsibility hackles start going up, you know, where I basically, I don't want to be responsible. I know I have to, but I don't like it. And uh, I'm like, oh, it's up to me to initiate change. Yeah. Yeah, because if you don't initiate change in a startup, you don't have anything. You're not even moving. The military has this, uh, this great concept of the initiative. One side has the initiative in any given engagement. That's the people who are acting and the other person's reacting. And there are military leaders through history who've been very good at, at seizing the initiative. So, you know, you've, you've only got, you know, your 300 people, but you don't wait for the other guy to come and smack you. You take the initiative because when you have the initiative, you've got a whole bunch of advantages. Yes, you're exposed, but the other guy, if you can make sure the other guy is uh, busy worrying about what you're going to do, he doesn't have time to think about what he's going to do to you. This happened late in the Civil War uh, when Grant went to the, uh, to the armies of the East and a reporter asked him, well, you know, what, what do you think Robert E. Lee is going to do next? And Grant said, I don't, I don't care what Lee is going to do next. I'm going to make him worry about what I'm going to do next. And that was the point that the, that the Civil War turned around um, there. So that for me is beyond agile development in the startup. Team vision and discipline, looking at the whole process and not just what one, not maximizing one person's output, focusing on learning instead of producing software. So it starts with the need and moves backwards. Discovering customers and this uh, change initiation process instead of waiting for the change to happen then, and then responding. I don't know how many minutes that means I have left, but that's okay. So, the, uh, I told you I was gonna talk about this uh, second principle. So the first principle was the principle of pull. That is, you don't start with build, you start with learning that you wanna have and work backwards to the build that you need. And the second principle is a principle of flow. Principle of flow says, if you have uh, uh, all other things being equal, uh, two deliveries, half and half, is more valuable than one delivery of the whole thing. And uh, I was talking to a, a guy in uh, Norway the other day, senior guy at a big consulting company, and he was telling me his startup strategy was to build a really finely polished product so nobody could possibly complain about it. And uh, you know, you spend a year and you make something that's really good and send it out. And I said, well, so sometimes when you do that, you get the message back, uh, nobody wants to buy this. Oh, yeah, that happens. So could you have built half the product and gotten that question answered? Yeah, sure. Wouldn't have been so polished. Okay. How about 
you know, three months worth. And that's the principle at flow at work. I'm trying to think, how can we shorten the time through this entire cycle? This came up the other day with respect to this game. So my wife is tired of me writing programs that don't make any money. So one of my... Really, you can ask her. Uh, so, so one of the things I want to validate early in this, process, this game is, can I make money? So the, the game has like a couple of natural parts. It divides into two parts. And I thought... Um, Okay, so you do the first part, and you get addicted to the game, right? That's how it's supposed to work. And then there's a button that pay, it says, I'll pay to use the second part. And I was talking to the engineer I was working with on this, and he said, okay, so we have to set up the payment gateway, and uh, ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum 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 And I thought, hmm, how could we slice this finer? To me, this is the engineering game of startup engineering is taking tasks that seem monolithic, cutting them into little pieces and rearranging the pieces. It's a cool puzzle to solve. By the time you've gone through learn and measure and you get to build, that's the point, you know, all of my engineering synapses are firing and I'm thinking, how can we slice this up? So I thought, okay, here's my cool idea. Now, in this room, this is unlikely to be remarkable, but I'm proud of myself, so I'm going to just tell you. That is, I thought, how could we do this without having to set up the payment gateway and da 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 I said, so how about if we write the first, both halves of the game, we put the buy button, and when you press buy, it just opens up the second half of the game, but sends us a message. So we know whether anybody's going to press the buy button. Because right now, we don't know if anybody's going to press the buy button at all. He's like, well... But everybody who pressed the buy button would just get the second and a half of the game for free. This is where it's wonderful not having customers. So what? <laughs> I love not having customers. Because when I make mistakes like, oh, not implementing the payment gateway, it's not a big deal. If I had a million customers and I didn't implement the payment gateway, I'd be stuffed. But I just want to find out if anybody's going to press the buy button. As a developer in a startup, I have to be thinking about that whole loop. And that's really what's different. It is not how can I do the best software development. It's how can I tighten the learn, measure, build loop as far as possible, make it as short as possible, and extract the maximum possible value out of each cycle through that loop. I should do the engineering that achieves that. Now, sometimes that's going to look like uh, mock-ups. It won't even be software at all. Uh, you know, I got an index card and some Sharpies. And I'll go like this. No. I just saved 18 hours. Am I a good engineer? Yeah. It won't impress my other engineer friends, but uh, they got their own startup problems. So that's okay. So sometimes it's going to look like hackery, base awful hackery. Yeah, we just uh, copy this file and change these two lines. Is anybody going to, are, are people going to play the game if it's more like this than like that? Well, we could uh, carefully refactor and derp, 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 derp. Well, that might feel good, right? It feels good to do good engineering. But that's not good startup engineering. Not if there's a cheaper way to get through that loop. That doesn't mean that always in a startup you're just hack, 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 and that's all you ever do. What happens when you hit, uh, when you hit scaling? You've got to switch modes from... The, the cycle you're going through isn't, can I attract customers? Right? That's not the learning you're trying to, to create. It's like the, the learning you're trying to create is, is there any way we can handle twice as many customers? That's the learning you need. And at that point, oh boy, do you need 
Test-driven development. Oh boy, do you need automation and refactoring and responsive design and being able to make your changes in parallel without disrupting stuff. And at some point, when you're saying, when the learning is, can we make more money from our current revenue stream, then engineering shifts yet again to, to being absolutely throughput-oriented. How can you reduce the cost of the engineering team? How can you re reduce the uh, operational costs? And it's something else yet again. To be an engineer, good engineering in a startup, goes through all those phases and notices the need to switch. And making those transitions seems to be really, really hard. I say that because I have trouble making those transitions. I also see a number of other people that do also. So can you realize, it? for a while, the engineering team builds features faster and faster, and they feel good. Oh, we can build a feature twice as fast this week as we did last week. Oh, man, that's pretty cool. Then you hit scaling, when your optimal engineering strategy is probably removing features and uh, carefully tuning the features that remain. So all of a sudden, the value system has to change, right? How you kept score has to change. And making those transitions seems to be very difficult because they're as much cultural as they are, uh, as they are technical. But the goal of building in a lean startup is minimizing the time through that loop and maximizing the value that's extracted from those. That's my uh, prepared slides. And I'm ready for questions. How much time do I have for questions? 10 minutes, super. So there's two mics here. I will also, no, there's, there's one mic stand, which is just kind of a tease, and then there's a real mic back there. But I will also repeat the questions as people ask them. That's cool. OK, yes? Uh, so I, the, I said you start with learn instead of build. Do you start with build if you're solving, solving your own problem? If you're solving your own problem, you already got learn. Oh, c can I automate the uh, invoicing, blah, 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 blah? I don't know. Can I do that? Let me make something and see whether I can do it. So I think it, if you're solving your own problem, to the extent that you really are solving your own problem, you already are starting with learn. Uh, another key that I found through bitter experience is I have a tendency to keep building after I'm done learning because I like the build stuff. So I will answer that question and I won't answer the next question which is like, does this solve anybody else's problem? Will anybody else use that? Maybe after a week I really could find out whether, whether what I'd built solved somebody else's problem. But I, in order to ask that question, I'd actually have to stop building, and I hate stopping building. So I keep going with the building even after my, the, the learning that I started with has, has ended. So I need reminders. Okay, so the question was, would, will anyone else get addicted to this game like I do? Yes. Okay, stop. What do I need to learn next? Not, oh, well, how do I make it even more addictive? Stop. Now, next question. Would anybody ever pay for the second half of this game? Okay, now what do I have to build for that? Yes? So the, the question is, uh, uh, 
the, the short-term, long-term balance in engineering. So you can, yes, we can do the first experiment with, uh, with copying a bunch of files and editing a line here and a line there and a line there. But, but you can't do that the third time. Or maybe you can do it the third time, but you go to do it the fourth time and you realized, oh, now I have to go change three copies. And so I'm, I'm, I'm stuck. I use the principles of pull and flow. Pull to me means that I'm going to restructure my code when I need the benefits of the restructuring, not necessarily when I understand. I could say, oh, I could uh, extract a this and a this and a this, or I could make this little DSL to express this part of the system, but I don't do it then because I don't need it then. I wait until I need it, and then I do the restructurings that I need. And then I use flow to think of how I could divide that big restructuring that I can imagine into small pieces that deliver value. So I think, oh, you know, yes, I could completely rearrange this code, but for this feature I need to add right now, I could do this much of that rearrangement, and then I'm going to go forward. And that means that my code is, is messy in spots when I'm in, when the learning I need is learning about needs. When the learning I need is learning about needs, then I have an extremely short-term problem and it's appropriate to apply a short-term answer. When the learning I need is learning about execution, it's a completely different landscape. At that point, Carefully crafting, you know, a, a great example is a, a Amazon's Dynamo, which is a technical tour de force, and they absolutely need it to operate at the scales that they operate at. But if they had started with Dynamo, they would have been on the scrap heap of other e-commerce companies. And it's managing that transition between the two that's a challenge. It's also a challenge for me to learn to enjoy the hacking part. Because right? I don't like messy code. So I have to learn to think, oh, hey, I thought this was going to take me four hours. It took me 15 minutes. Cool. Ew, the code's a little messy. Yeah, okay, code's messy. Get over it. Especially at this stage. Yes? I'm just passing the mic. Anybody else have questions? Yeah, I usually sit on the product side of things, and I'm concerned or curious how to speak to engineers in such a way that they do understand that you know messiness is okay. I'm wondering what are sort of the blocks, because to me it makes sense. You know, it makes perfect sense. Okay, we just got to get this thing out. And I understand also, I mean, I, I build things at times as well, and I understand this idea that you really want to build it right. But uh, there seems to be a natural sort of disconnect between engineering and between product. And I'm wondering if you could sort of speak from the engineering side how to heal that disconnect. Well, for me, the fundamental resistance is that I want to do a good job. I'd like to have a system that, I, that I'm proud of, that I'm proud, you know, if, if another engineer walked in the room and they looked at it, they wouldn't go, you know, who, who would do something like this? I had a friend who was a very early in, uh, in an Amazon, and his nickname was Mr. Flatfile. Because engineers would say, well, we could relational normalization, blah, blah, blah. He says, like, could you put it in a flat file? Oh, yeah. Well, what does that optimize? Does that optimize uh, uh, engineering satisfaction? No. It optimizes time through the learn, measure, build cycle. You got to learn to appreciate that. You got to learn when that's appropriate. You need to learn when it's not appropriate. So I would ask, what would, how would I like to be treated in that situation where I'm stuck in this micro-optimizing uh, micro thinking? I would like you to say to me, how quickly could we answer this question? 
not how fast could you build this feature? Yeah, I like that question. How quickly, so don't give me a, a you know, would, we want to rearrange the widgets like this, how fast could you build that? Well, uh, first we're going to have to write a DSL for a bu 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 bu. If you came to me with the question, we have, we'd like to increase conversions here. To do that seems like the kind of thing we want to experiment with is rearranging the page flows. How fast could we answer that question? Oh, well, we could just set up some static HTML and run 100 customers through it. OK. Well, that's an engineering solution to a bigger problem. You didn't ask me, how quickly can I build this feature? You asked me, how fast can we uh, serve this business need? We need a, we need a question answer. And I think, I think I would respond to that. I don't know about any other engineers. You can ask other people in the, in the room who are like that. Last question. Yes. So the question is, I seem to have changed my mind about some of these issues. Uh, how much of that is, uh, how abrupt was that? That's an interesting question. Like, are you worried about what's going to happen to you? you? That's actually a serious question. I mean, you don't have to answer it, because it would be. If it seems, if I gave you the impression that this seems clear to me, the, it, I, I, I misrepresented myself. I find this incredibly difficult, personally, because I want to do good engineering. Good there is defined as uh, self-serving. <laughs> <laughs> and, and every time I do a hack, part of me you know, just shrivels up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then I got to think, no, wait. I'm not, I'm not inside build. I'm in learn, measure, build. Oh, cool. I can be proud of that bigger cycle. It, was it gradual or was it sudden? It's a, a gradual series of sudden changes. Fantastic. All right, we're just going to do another quick laptop check.